Hello and welcome to this Mary Live special. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends, as the whole world knows, this upcoming United States election has a historic aspect to it. And so in today's program, I want to go through some basic moral principles that should guide every Catholic, and I would say by extension, every person of goodwill, in how we vote from a true moral Catholic perspective. Now, before we get into a couple principles that should guide us in how we vote, which is of such a quintessential importance, let's go over the role of the church in re regarding things like a political election. First of all, let's establish that the church, the Catholic Church, has a grave moral responsibility to proclaim the truths of Jesus and the gospel as it applies in the moral and social realms of human life. This is the church's obligation. What aspect, what, what social arena could we say, well, the teachings of Jesus are simply irrelevant particularly for the Catholic. So, of course, the church is going to articulate the moral and social teachings of the church. But let me go through these three categories of moral and social and political for a moment so we get our bearings correct. For the Catholic, the Holy Spirit, through the office of Peter, the Pope, guides the church and protects the church from error on matters of faith and morals. So, for example, the magisterium guarantees the truth, the moral truth, that it is always wrong to directly kill an innocent human being. This comes forward from the Ten Commandments, from the prefix, uh, precepts of the church, and of course it applies to the reality, the, the tragic reality of abortion. So in such a teaching, the church is protected from error by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's the moral, faith and morals dimension. But what do we mean by the social teachings dimension? Well, the social teachings of the church are either A, a component of the moral teaching, for example, the church's social teaching on the intrinsic evil of abortion, or B, a social teaching can be a prudential application of the church's moral teachings in a particular ap uh, aspect of social life. So, for example, to say that it is appropriate that workers have a just wage in this historic uh, particular uh, societal situation. So, the social teachings of the church are either a component of the moral teaching, once again the abortion example, or they're a prudential application of the moral teachings for society now. Thirdly, there is the political realm. Now, the church by our own teaching states the importance, the imperative for, for example, bishops or, or priests to speak to the people about moral and social issues as it comes forward, even proximate to an election. What the church is not supposed to do is to enter specifically the political arena in such a way as to say, for example, you as a Catholic must vote for this particular candidate by name. Or you as a Catholic should be a member of this political party. That's where the church allows the individual to follow a logical application and an honest application of the church's moral and social teachings. So, do not be surprised. In fact, you should applaud bishops and priests from the pulpit on, on, on Sundays to strongly articulate the moral and social teachings of the church insofar as it's relevant to an election. It would be an inappropriate other thing for uh, a particular pastor or bishop to say, you must vote for this candidate. You, you see the distinctions. So, 
Social and moral, absolutely. But the church should not be entering specifically the, politic or the political dimension by saying, vote for him and don't vote for this person. Okay. Having said that, let's go over three principles that should guide an authentic Catholic in voting. And then, in, indeed, it's the task of the Catholic to make the political application of that. So, the first principle is that there is a hierarchy or a order of priorities regarding what we hold as Catholics, that is, values. So, for example, it would not be appropriate for a Catholic to put financial goods or material goods over moral, spiritual, personal goods. For example, if, an, if, a, if a particular candidate said, I'm just going to be honest, I'm a terrorist, I'm going to have terrorism as part of my platform, uh, but I'm going to get you a better job. Well, obviously, that would be to put, if, if one were to be convinced by such an argument, that would be to put a better job over the spiritual, moral, personal values, which is not an option for an authentic Catholic. And again, I'm speaking to Catholics in this video. Obviously, this is not unique to Catholics. It, it, it extends to Christians, and as I mentioned before, people of goodwill, people who, who as St. Paul says, are law unto themselves, uh, who, who understand and, and, and hear the natural law in their soul. Of course, this would guide them as well. Or for example, if a particular political candidate said, Look, I'm going to be honest, I do participate in child abuse. Child abuse is going to be part of my platform, but I promise you I'm going to lower taxes. Well, obviously that would be disorder because you're, you're putting the monetary over the personal, the spiritual, and the moral. So there is a hierarchy, there's an order of priorities in terms of value that a authentic Catholic recognizes. Okay? Point number one. Principle number one. Principle number two is that the right to life is the social issue which our Holy Fathers and the U.S. bishops have clearly said is the preeminent social issue. Why? Because it presupposes and becomes the foundation of all other social rights. An easy example. A person is not going to be overly concerned about the right to vote or the right to bear arms if the person isn't living, right? So, both logically and ethically, the right to life, that a person has a transcendent dignity from conception to natural death, is the foundation of all other social rights. So. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I don't want to become just a, a one-issue voter. Well, understood appropriately, the one issue of life logically, metaphysically, and, and ethically is the foundation for all other secondary rights to life, like, uh, or, or, or properties, I should say, you know, uh, social rights, private property. Uh, once again, the, the privilege to vote. These are non-issues if one is not alive. So it is right to say that the right to life is the foundation of all other social rights and values, and it is preeminent. It has a first place uh, in the order of the hierarchy of rights, and it should also in our hearts as well. This leads to principle number three. It is morally prohibited and morally evil for an authentic Catholic to vote for a pro-abortion candidate, political candidate, or political platform. Now let's get very specific here. The church, and particularly through uh, documents have come forward from the Congregation uh, for the Doctrine of Faith. And, and, and these, in fact, uh, what I'm going to mention are, are from Cardinal Ratzinger while he was the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, who specifies 
that, uh, and again, in capturing the overall mind of John Paul II and, and all of his uh, documents, which are obviously quintessentially pro-life, pro-family, pro-moral, that the Catholic cannot support a pro-abortion platform. Now, Cardinal Ratzinger specifies two potential uh, exceptions. One is if you have two pro-abortion candidates at the same time. And the commentary allows, in that case, for what we call the lesser evil. Whichever candidate uh, has less of the evil, uh, since they're both pro-abortion. The other possibility of allowing a, a vote for a pro-life candidate, and again, please understand uh, the extraordinary rareness uh, and, and extremeness of such a position, would be if a candidate said, I'm pro-life, but for example, I want to start a nuclear war next week. Well, then there's a disproportion because of the exponential evil. Or I'm pro-life, but I want to return and will return as my platform every principle of Nazism as it was professed by Hitler. Well, well obviously, in, in fact, those are both contradictions anyway, as we understand. But only in situations as grave and as extreme as those could you ever justify of voting for a pro-abortion candidate when there's a pro-life candidate available. Uh, and again, think of a scale, my friends, and on one side of the scale you have life. You don't want to put on the other scale and think it's going to have an equal value if you say, well, but I don't like the personality of this candidate. I think this candidate has bad manners. I think there's other uh, issues where this candidate is not Perfect. Well, one could say, well, granted to those, but those do not logically or ethically or morally outweigh a pro-life, pro-family candidate or platform. And this all, uh, if you will, culminates to the issue of the upcoming election. And I say this as a faithful Catholic in full conformity with the magisterium of the church. If we put all this together and we make the proper application, we can say that it is morally reprehensible, morally wrong, uh, and of grave, significant moral culpability if a person knows for a practicing Catholic, for an authentic Catholic to vote for a pro-abortion candidate in the political realm or a pro-abortion policy in the political realm. Now, this could beg the question, well, what about the many, both politicians, but also citizens of the United States, who say, well, wait a minute, I'm Catholic and I'm pro-abortion. Well, let's examine that for a moment, my friends, because that seems to manifest a rather grave absence of authenticity and an even moral or societal, let alone ecclesial, legitimacy. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take this example. Let's say a person said, you know, I'm a practicing member of the military as a self-identification. But in fact, the person's not in the military. The person does not uh, receive formation from the military, and in fact, the person rejects, in this case, core positions, core principles of the military. Well then, one could understandably uh, reject that as a, as a legitimate identification. But we can say the same analogously about a person who says, look, I am a practicing Catholic, but I'm pro-abortion. One would have to ask the tough examination of conscience questions in, su in such a case. Uh, on what basis would you identify yourself as a Catholic if you're rejecting the core beliefs of the institution of the church? I mean, it, it is true that if you identify as a member of a movement or an institution, 
that presupposes that you grant and you uphold the foundational elements and beliefs, convictions of that institution. Otherwise, can we not understand why questions of, or, or even accusations of hypocrisy seem to raise in the discussion? Well, how can you say you're this when you hold to that? Uh, and, and so I think this calls for a deep examination of conscience and if you, my friend, if, if you are a person who identifies as Catholic, but you are planning to vote for a candidate that has a pro-abortion foundational platform, including a candidate who may state that even apart from the Supreme Court, uh, a candidate's pledging to make abortion a federal law, the law of the land, I ask you, first of all, is that a position of an authentic Catholic based on what the church teaches as a core, central, foundational truth? That life begins at conception and it is intrinsically evil to directly kill an innocent human being and therefore to participate in an abortion is one of the five ways to be excommunicated from the institution we call the Catholic Church. So one would have to ask some hard questions of integrity, of, of authenticity, of, of honesty to say, I am a practicing Catholic, but I plan to do this. More importantly, my friend, if, if that's a situation you're in right now, I wanna make a plea to you here. I, I, I want to beg you of something right now because if you vote for a pro-abortion candidate in the political arena, to some legitimate, to some significant degree, you are cooperating in a moral evil. And the, the application of that is, if you're supporting through your vote, which is so valuable, a candidate that is pro-abortion, are you not participating in some significant level of cooperation, even if it's not proximate, every single abortion that's gonna happen as a result of the election, the assumed election of your candidate, and a abortion policy, which could become the law, quote, the law of the land. You don't want that on your soul. You don't want to be responsible for killing babies in the womb. We all know that's what it is. So here's the plea. I beg you, I beg you to reconsider. And when you get into that private sanctuary called the ballot box, or even as you fill out a, an anticipated voting or an absentee ballot, do the right thing for the love of God. Do the right thing and do not vote for a, a candidate or a policy that has as a foundation, a core foundation, an undeniable metaphysical foundation of the party to kill children in the womb. Because Mother Teresa had it right. If babies are not safe in the womb, do not expect violence to stop in the streets. And ultimately, as much as I'm concerned about the future of our country, and I'm very much concerned, I'm even more concerned about your soul, that you do not have on your soul the weight, the burden, the blood of innocent human life. That's not an exaggeration, my friends. It's a true level, in some significant way, of a cooperation in abortion. And you don't want to have any such participation in such a gravely evil and, and, and a historic call for justice upon our country. Now I want to bring Our Lady into the issue of the election. If your first knee-jerk reaction is, oh gosh, well don't bring the Blessed Mother into the election. What does she have to do with the election? I would say, my friends, that's a bit of a red flag because there should be no aspect of your authentically Catholic life where you hesitate to bring the mother of Jesus in 
as model, as guide, as mediatrix of all grace, as teacher, as St. John Paul II says, what would Our Lady do in a situation like this? And yes, of course, the first question is what would Jesus do? But let's apply it further and more proximate to Our Lady in this sense. Our Lady would never participate in any action against her children, her children, because she's the spiritual mother of all, her children in the womb. Of course, it is through Our Lady's Immaculate Womb that we get the unborn Jesus to enter humanity to redeem us. That's why she's called the co-redemptrix, the human co-redemptrix with the divine redeemer. Also, remember, the church teaches that Mary, as a dogma, was immaculately conceived. From what? From the moment of conception. So her very dogma is a pro-life testimony. Our Lady would want you to always respect, always protect human life in all of its forms, starting in the womb. Now, I want to bring Our Lady into it in another degree because, of course, October 7th is the great feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. My friends, these beads, these beads have already on several occasions occasions changed the course of human history. That's not an exaggeration, that's historical fact. As we go back to October 7th, 1571, and the great Battle of Lepanto, the victory, the supernaturally aided victory that comes through the praying of the Rosary, and many other occasions as well. So I'm asking you, faithful Catholics, and, and all people who are open, I'm asking you to pray the rosary, and I, I hear several of you already saying, well, Mark, I'm already doing that, but, but listen further. To pray the rosary starting on October 7th, every day, until we hear the definitive results of the election for two intentions. Number one, that God's preferred candidate will be elected to guide our country that God's preferred candidate will be elected to guide our country. And number two, that you will pray for fellow Catholics to have a freedom of conscience and an illumination of heart to in no way support a political candidate that's pro-abortion or a political pro a platform that's pro-abortion. Pray for your brother and sister Catholics to do the right thing in the ballot box. And that's how we can powerfully bring Our Lady into this election and perhaps, through her most powerful intercession, once again, change the course of human history. Now I want to end with a true story. And this is a story that was revealed to me directly from the woman involved. And this was a woman who was married to a husband who was alcoholic and had a gambling addiction. In fact, this woman would experience her husband just on one weekend taking the life savings of the woman's father and it took him 50 years of six days a week working as a chef to accumulate $80,000, which he was going to bequeath to the family, the husband, the alcoholic and addicted husband, took that money without the wife's knowing it and went up to Vegas and lost it in a weekend. This woman would also, within the next three years, experience the death of her oldest child, uh, her daughter, to leukemia. Well, the woman at that time had two children and she newly became pregnant with her third child. And this woman had always been very subservient to her mother-in-law. And the mother-in-law said, look, you got to face the facts. You're in no condition to have another child. So do the, the only thing you can do. Here are abortion pills. 
I want you to take a hot bath and I want you to take these abortion pills and this issue will be over. So the woman, in a great struggle, got into the bath, had the hot water, had the pills on the side of the bath, and up to this point had never, never questioned uh, anything that the mother-in-law had told her to do. And finally the woman said, I cannot do this. I can't kill my child. Well, I say, thanks be to God, because that woman was my mother. And I thank my mother, who died last December 12th on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe at the ripe age of 94. I thank you, Mom, for life. My eight kids thank you for life. My nine grandchildren thank you for life. And I'm so grateful to be alive today for all the riches of, of what it means to be alive and also more pertinent to this issue, to be able to vote. What I'm tragically sad about are the 65 million fellow Americans that are not here to be able to be alive or to be able to vote on November 3rd because they were aborted. 65 million Americans since 1973. My friends and Jesus and Mary, do the right thing. Vote for life and have a peace of conscience and a tranquility of soul that you're doing what our Lord and what our Lady and what decency calls you to do. It's Dr. Mark Miravalli. Thank you. God bless you.